Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Well, we've uh, reached the 15th verse of the first chapter of Galatians. So we're going to continue on in our study through this amazing epistle. In our last study, we were uh, in the area of verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1. Just uh, by way of review, the Holy Spirit has chosen to address this epistle to the churches at Galatia because they were infiltrated with those who were adding works to the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I pointed out in previous studies that the two main attacks that have been made against the Word of God have always been to subtract from it or to add to the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the burden of the epistle to the Galatians is the addition of human merit, the inclusion of human merit to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking at. The Holy Spirit has chosen to use Paul as the one who pens this epistle. The, of course, the Holy Spirit is the author, but Paul is, is only the writer. And in chapter 1, we were uh, informed that the believers at Galatia had instantly, suddenly departed from the grand good news of the finished work of Christ to that which is not another gospel, because it's a false gospel and the strong language is used by the Holy Spirit that if an angel from heaven, if any human or, or even an angel from heaven or, or even Paul himself should preach any other gospel unto you other than that which had been preached to you at Paul's previous visits, let him be accursed. And then... The Holy Spirit emphasizes that again, and I believe God has guarded His Word. He's magnified His Word above all His name. I think we should take note when He repeats Himself. It's astounding how lightly the so-called Christian church has treated this book. What a precious thing to be able to hold in your hands. We don't know how long we'll be able to do that. The infallible Word of the Almighty Eternal God and yet it occupies so little of our precious study time. The Holy Spirit is pointing out that this is absolute truth and it shouldn't be tampered with. The curses in the Word of God are pronounced upon those who subtract from it or add to it. And those have always been the attacks. Now after that strong denunciation of of any gospel contrary to that which had been preached to, to them. The Holy Spirit is certifying the apostleship of Paul. God knew they, and probably us as well, would argue that in Paul addressing this church, even though inspired by the Holy Spirit, he doesn't have the proper credentials. He's not qualified. He doesn't have the proper credentials, and he doesn't have the, the credentials of an apostle. Normally, the word apostle appears in the Word of God as one who has seen the Lord. However, we find that Timothy is addressed as an apostle. Barnabas is addressed as an apostle. So even though those in the early church would argue that, that uh, you know, that they, they would take more credence in the word of the, the original apostles who had seen the Lord face to face than they would in others who were sent by the church, the Holy Spirit is pointing out that they can use that same uh, credence here. For Paul, he didn't receive what he preached from man. He wasn't taught it by man. The text makes it clear. It wasn't man's logic or man's wisdom or, or man's gospel. And even though demons may be behind false religions, all of the false religions come out of the theories and the philosophies of men 
No man, no man would have ever proposed a religion like Christianity. That man is totally depraved, totally unable to do anything. Folks, just name any other religion that would even suggest such a thing. And because it is so contrary to our human mind, even Christianity is infiltrated, seriously infiltrated, with the thought that we, we are participants in our redemption. We were not. I'm talking about a synergistic redemption, one in which you play a, a role, you have a part, but that's not Christianity. No man's logic would have proposed the redemption of a group of people who were totally depraved, who didn't love God, who weren't seeking God, who weren't working for God. In fact, were, were His enemies. And yet He extended Himself toward them. He paid the price for them and redeemed them unto Himself through no merit, no merit, no merit of their own. That's the gospel that He preached. And he's authorized to preach it because he didn't receive it from man. He wasn't taught it by man, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we got to verses 13 and 14, talking about his early life, how he persecuted the church and wasted it. He was doing that, but he never completed it. It's an imperfect tense. And he profited in the Jews' religion. Verse 14, above many of those of my own age, because he was more exceedingly zealous. Now, zealous. Now, don't get the idea that he was a zealot. Uh, those were a group of people who were exceedingly involved in keeping the law and the, and the, the very minutia of the law. Paul is simply using the word zealous here, not to say that he was a zealot, but that he was more than normally zealous. And he says, at the tradition of my fathers. And this is about where we ended last week. I touched on uh, verse 15 last week. Don't look at, at the tr tradition of my fathers as the Mosaic law. The law was not given on Mount Sinai to live by. And Israel, of course, well, they boasted to say that all, oh, well, all the Lord, all that the Lord tells us to do, we'll do. And of course, they didn't do any of it. By the time you get to Jeremiah, you haven't obeyed me in one thing, God says. You've been forced to do certain things that I told you to do, but you haven't from the heart obeyed me in one single thing. Why is that? Because the flesh can't do that. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, 7, 7 and 8. They don't have any power to please God. Why? Dearly beloved, why would anybody who professes to be a Christian go around preaching that we have to do something to please God when the Scriptures declare that they that are in the flesh cannot please God? The works of the flesh are all evil. Nobody, no man would propose such a theory. And that bothered the Pharisees. And so they delved deeply into their traditions of the law. And it's that that Paul preached and that Paul was zealously involved in obeying the Sabbath and all the ceremonial laws and all of the, all of the filth and the, all of the corruption that accompanied it. You remember the Lord, in, in one instance, He drove them out of the temple using a whip. They had made the house of, of His Father a den of thieves. That's what it was. Imagine what happened in verse 15. I think the Holy Spirit has given us verses 12, 13, and 14 for us to realize that here was a young man zealously involved in what he thought was right. You know, if you've ever studied the history of Martin Luther, he was a monk who was zealously interested in pleasing God. He went to the, uh, to, to the confessional so often that uh, 
that one priest told him, you know, you need to go out and really do something really bad so that you've got something to confess. And it was Martin Luther who crawling on his knees up the steps in Rome, the verse suddenly hits his mind, justified by the faithfulness of God, and it changed his life. And books have been written. You know, what a tremendous difference that, that made in Martin Luther. And I suggest to you that they all pale in, signif in, in significance compared to the change that took place in the life of Saul. He dedicated his life to the tradition of his fathers. And now the Holy Spirit has him write in the simplest of language. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. Now don't get the idea that, that that's saying that when he was born, God chose him. That idiom says that in God's sovereign will, and only God's, not Paul's, not Saul's, not anything he did, God didn't look down and say, now, there, now there's some guy really trying to serve me. He wasn't trying to serve God. He, he was serving the tradition of his fathers. Same thing's happening today. And he was putting to death those for whom Christ died. When one reads the, the martyr's story in, in Fox's Book of Martyrs and, and realizes what the organized church did to some of those who loved the Lord, one can't help but try to imagine what took place in the courts of heaven. And Paul was putting people to death. He was there consenting to the stoning of the first martyr, Stephen. When it pleased God. When it pleased God. It was God, only His sovereign will, who separated Paul before he was born. He separated me for Himself before I was ever born, says Paul. One would have to think, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm here is somebody separated by the sovereign de decree of God for God's own purposes, who for maybe 50 years of his life was involved in that which was anti-God, anti-church, anti... -God, anti Christian, God even designing His life in such a way that he, would, he put to death those who were God's own children when it was God's will that He do so. The word please there goes back to the will of God. No merit in Paul who separated me for himself before I was ever born. And he called me by means of His grace. Grace. We do a terrible thing to the grace of God when we suggest that involved in the grace of God is some human merit. You know, it's ingrained in the Sunday school child. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then the Sunday school teacher seems forced to point out that, well, there was something different, something better, something kinder, something gentler, something nobler, you know, whatever in Noah, so that God looked at him and said, oh man, there's somebody I ought to shower grace on. Folks, if that's the truth, then grace is, is not grace. If it be of works, then grace is no longer grace. God called him by His grace when he was God's enemy, when he was working against God, when he didn't believe God, when there was no truth in what he was doing at all. As the enemy of God, God called him. That's grace. That's grace. And he's our example. It's God and his grace. You'll read in 1 Timothy, verse 15 and 16, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him to life everlasting. That's you and that's me. 
what happened to Paul was a prototype for all of those who should hereafter believe that God called him by His grace and that God had separated him from before he was born. We see in Ephesians, one of the first books that we studied through, the very next book, Galatians. You know, you have Galatians and Ephesians. The Lord arranged them that way that He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. How could it be that modern Christianity has moved away from these marvelous passages of Scripture? That He chose everybody. And of those whom He chose, those who believe will go to heaven and those who don't believe go to hell. How can you do that to this book? How can you do that to the Word of God? You're going to say, you're going to tell me that he chose someone in Christ before the foundation of the world and they went to hell? What, what kind of choosing is that? What kind of a father is that? What kind of a God is that? Why even use the word chose if it doesn't mean what it means? Almost all Christians look at Paul as headed for hell until his Damascus experience. And then some uh, dramatic experience happened in his life. He chose Christ. So now he's no longer headed for hell. He's headed for, for heaven. I contend based on the Word of God, had he died when he was 12, he'd have gone to heaven. Had he died when he was consenting to the stoning of Stephen, he would have gone to heaven as God's chosen vessel. God does not choose willy-nilly. God doesn't choose lightly. He chose me before I was born and He called me by His grace and He did that to reveal His Son in me. Now this is a real problem with a lot of Bible teachers. They have a real problem with this. Because what the human mind apparently wants to say is that God singled Paul out to reveal Christ to others and so that in Paul, he's revealing Jesus Christ to other believers and I don't for one minute think that that's what that verse says. I think that verse says that Paul received a special revelation of Jesus Christ. I believe Paul on the road to Damascus, he saw Him visibly not just some vision. Now, he was struck blind, but when he went to Ananias, you remember Ananias, the Lord said, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, sending, I'm sending Saul to you. Ananias said, I, you know, I can't believe my ears. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a literal translation. You wouldn't do that. You know, God basically says, shut up, Ananias. He's a chosen vessel for me. And when he came, Ananias said to Paul, the Lord who appeared to you, appeared. Now, I'm not trying to glorify Paul. And I don't believe that Paul is the only apostle to the Gentiles, but I do believe that he is a particular apostle to the Gentiles and that he received a revelation, a special revelation of Jesus Christ that the other apostles did not. And, and I believe that's intuitively obvious to any Bible student who would sit down and try to organize his theology. He would come to the, to the conclusion that his primary theological outline comes from those epistles. The Holy Spirit chose to use Paul to write, and Paul is a particular apostle to the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit then goes on and says, this is a special revelation. And I've already told you, says the Holy Spirit, that He didn't receive it from men, that He wasn't taught it by man. And so immediately, I did not consult with humankind. The word conferred is our word consult. I didn't go to the experts. I didn't consult with anyone else in order to learn. Neither did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. Where are the experts in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord? Well, they're in Jerusalem. They're Peter, 
and James and John and Matthew and Mark and so forth, the sons of Zebedee. That's where the experts are. We're going to find out in this epistle that when he went there, he, they added nothing to him. Those who appear to be experts added nothing to me. That's an amazing verse. We'll, we'll get there someday, Lord willing. Anybody at this time in history who wanted to know as much as they could learn about Jesus Christ would go to Jerusalem and to the apostles, but Paul didn't. So what I'm preaching, I did not get from the apostles. Not only did I not get it from man, neither was I taught it by man, but now I didn't even get it from the apostles. It was a special revelation of Jesus Christ to me. Not me revealing Jesus Christ to others, but a particular and special revelation of Jesus Christ to me. So I didn't go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. The Holy Spirit has Paul say, I am an apostle. The other, the, the other apostles saw him in the flesh. He was still in the flesh when they saw him on the shores of the Sea of, of Galilee after he rose from the dead. But Paul received a revelation from heaven. As you have seen the Lord, I have seen the Lord. I also am an apostle to those who were apostles before me, he says. In Corinthians, you know, uh, we were told, one born out of due time. You know, when he talks about the appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection, he appeared to James and then he appeared to me as one born out of due time. Out of due time. For Paul's revelation was unique. It was not only the risen Christ, but it was the risen Christ seated in glory to those who were apostles before me in time. But I immediately, immediately I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Now, one of the jeopardy questions, I guess, could be, well, how long was Paul in Arabia? And if you answer, well, three years, you're the only one that knows that. It doesn't say that he stayed three years in Arabia. And it doesn't say he didn't. I don't know. I had no idea. And it's astounding to me how much literature is written on how many years Paul spent in Arabia. I, I, I have no idea. I know that immediately after his meeting with Ananias in Damascus, after he had been struck down on the road to Damascus, he went into Arabia. How long he was there, I don't know. But then he returned to Damascus, and it's three years after his experience on the road to Damascus that he went up to Jerusalem. He goes up to Jerusalem. Now, it's generally thought that what had happened to Paul would require some serious thought, and so he probably spent some time in Arabia. The word there uh, described as Arabia is, a, is a, a desert, a lonely place. And, and so, you, you know, we, one has to get the idea that wherever Paul went, he was alone with the Scriptures and he was alone with the Lord. I, I can't put it put into words. Uh, uh, somebody ought to be able to preach a real sermon on this. Here's a man dedicated to what he thought was right, putting to death those who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And all of a sudden, he's seen that, that Messiah in his glorified state. This means that everything that he lived for Everything that he, he thought, everything he believed, everything he taught was wrong. Kind of reminds me of Albert Einstein, you know, who said that they were a unique generation, the generation that could end war forever. You know, if they just succeeded with the, in the development of the atomic bomb, you know, if they succeeded in their project, no nation would ever, ever be able to declare war on another nation again. 
you know, we, you know, we had such an awesome weapon that war would become a obsolete, it'd become a thing of the past, and, and they, they designed thermonuclear weapons that have no practical limit. You know, we make them any size we want, and, you know, we just blow up the whole world. You know, and Einstein broke down before the Congress of the United States, an old man with tears running down his cheek, died shortly after that. He had followed a dream that was not true. He hadn't ended war forever. Imagine to think that one would work so hard and be so convinced that the results of his work would bring in everlasting peace just to find out that he labored for a dream that was in vain. Well, that's nothing compared to Paul. Everything that he held dear, all of the progress he had made in the Jews' religion, all of the things that, that he had taught, and all of the work that he had put in to suppress the, the preaching of the Messiah, all of that was wrong. I believe the Lord's called me to be a Bible teacher, and yet I look back over the years of my life, and, and I look at how it could have been better spent preparing for that. Imagine Paul, 50 years. Was that wasted time? No, it wasn't wasted. Nobody, nobody had a firmer grasp on the horror of human merit than Paul. If you ask why God spent so much time in the Old Testament to preach that man can't obey the law of God, why did he spend so many years in the life of Paul to make him so skilled in the, in the nuances of the law? Paul became the great apostle to the Gentiles. I don't know what he did in Arabia, but I am absolutely certain absolutely certain that when he unrolled those scrolls of the Old Testament Scriptures, they jumped alive in his mind. He saw things that he had never seen before so that he could write that. All of these Scriptures are given for our profit. They're good for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction and in righteousness. This is what Paul said. This is the man who put Christians to death and how the Scriptures must have opened themselves up to Him. That's the interesting thing about the Word of God. Is it is absolute truth, but it, it is only truth to those indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that opens the Word to you. And I believe in God's good pleasure and God's good design that He has made it necessary for us to labor over the Word of God. Imagine what the Word of God must have meant to him shortly after this experience. I am certain that, that Paul the Apostle had to study it diligently and it may well be that he spent the better part of that three years alone poring over the Word of God. What a wonderful privilege to feast on it to rejoice in the fact that it's God's Word and it's God's Word to you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful, so very thankful for the time that we've had to think about these precious passages of Scripture. Oh, may it grip our hearts and may we be zealously involved in the study of Your Word May we buy up the time to feast upon Your Word, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of You. For it's in Your name we pray. Amen. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Our Lord is coming back soon.